Well, hello, my name is Al Meredith. I want to welcome you to Fort Worth, Texas, here at Wedgwood Baptist Church, where they've made me Pastor Emeritus after 28 years of being the chief cook and bottle washer. Uh, bottle washer. I retired several years ago, but I'm still glad to serve here. I do these weekly presentations. We're right smack in the middle of a study on the 12 apostles. I call it the training of the 12. What kind of men did Jesus choose to be his inner circle, his core group, his green berets, so to speak, to turn the world upside down as they eventually did? It's interesting. They are particularly normal, ordinary. In fact, in some cases, in God's school for slow learners. But it's amazing. It's not the man, it's the God in the man that he uses. Let me pray and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this truth you've laid upon my heart. I thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Holy Spirit, speak your truth through me today. Custom fit it to meet the name, needs of everyone who's listening in today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Periodically, I get these rather persistent emails with intriguing promises. One I remember getting from, and it said, Houston, subject, quote unquote, you are liked. Well, that's nice. And then it goes on to say, we received an email from someone you know. Uh, and this person wants a blind date. Evidently, they didn't know me that much because I've been married for 54 years. But anyway, it goes on to say, please fill out the profile. More information to come. And then it's signed, quote unquote, looking for a hot one. I never really knew I was a hottie, but in someone's eyes, evidently I am. Guys, our generation is like the old song goes, looking for love in all the wrong places. Back in the 70s, Burt Backrack, his most famous song, you're thinking of it right now, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's too little of. I remember hearing about one personal ad. Back before they had internet, you would put personal ads in the newspaper. And this one said, a 35-year-old farmer looking for a wife must own tractor. P.S. Send picture of the tractor. <laughs> well, today I want to look into the life and the calling of the Apostle John. John, whom I understand to be, by his own admission, the one whom Jesus loved. The life of the Apostle John is proof positive of the power of God's transform transforming love. In Trafalgar Square in downtown London, you have what's known as Cleopatra's Needle. It's an obelisk that came from Egypt when the English took over Egypt from the French in the 1880s, they, as they often would do back then, dismantled this archaeological wonder and shipped it en masse and set it up on a foundation, a basis, a square. And uh, for all the world to see, and as they began to put it together, they said, we ought to include a time box, something that when archaeologists millennia from now look back, will get an understanding of what Victorian England was all about. And so they put in a pair of bifocal glasses, a copy of the New York Times newspaper, and somebody said, we ought to put a Bible in there, because the Victorian England was very much about religion and Christianity and the Bible. But that was too big, so they said, let's take one verse out of the Bible that kind of epitomizes the entirety of the Bible's message. And so the theologians had a heyday debating what one verse says at all, and they finally settled on this verse. It is found in the Gospel of John. You know where I'm going right now. Chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Perhaps the greatest verse in the greatest book in the entire universe about God's love. And it's the Apostle John who talks more about the love of God than any other writer in the gospel. 
So let's look into, first of all, what John was. A little bit about his family. Keep your finger there in John, but turn over with me to Gospel of Mark and chapter 1. The first chapter of the Gospel of Mark in verses 19 and 20. Andrew and John had left their nets to go and hear this wild prophet John the Baptist who was preaching revival in the Jordan River Valley. And Jesus shows up and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it says in verse 17, Then Jesus said to them, that is John and Andrew, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with his hired servants and went after him. So there's some things we can understand about John. First of all, about his family. He came from a relatively wealthy family. His father had a fishing business, several ships, and he had a number of servants that could take over the work when his sons wanted to run off gallivanting around Judea. At the cross, as Jesus is about to die, he says, woman, behold your son. And then it says after Jesus died that, that he took Mary, Jesus' mother, to his house. So evidently he was one of the relatively few people in his age that owned his own home there in Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. He was wealthy. Secondly, about his family, he was spoiled. Think of it. Here's a grown adult man, kind of a half partner with his father and his brother in the family fishing business, and he's allowed to leave his nets and go off gallivanting and chasing around after John the Baptist in the Judean wilderness. Well, there are servants to do the work. I'm sure dad would send money. Mama would see to it that he'd send money for her son. So when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, and pointed to Jesus, John the Apostle was hooked. He was one of the first to be called. He was among the first to whom Jesus said, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he, like the others, left everything. I'll go on to say this about John. He was part of the inner circle in Jesus' flock. There were the twelve, and then there were the three, Peter, James, and John. He had a doting mother by the name of Salome, who also left home to follow Christ. I wonder if she was there to look after her sons, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So he was wealthy, he was spoiled. What about his character? Well, secondly, I would say you could, it could be said of John that he was indeed prejudiced. Look at Luke chapter 9, let me begin with verse four, uh, 52. And as they went, that Jesus and the apostles, they entered a village, entered a village of Samaritans to prepare for Jesus. But when the Samaritans did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem, and when John, his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Here were these rotten, despicable, hated Samaritans, and they wouldn't even welcome Jesus into into their village and James and John whose nicknames were the sons of thunder evidently they got into their share of bar fights wanted to call down fire to kill everybody in the village Samaritans as you know were hated by the Jews and he wants to rain down fire upon them after three years at the feet of Jesus Listening to every parable, every lesson, every injunction, three years seeing Jesus, how he loved the unlovable, he's still of a mind to kill all of his Samaritan enemies. <laughs> Bertrand Russell was one of Britain's best known atheists, 19th century philosopher and mathematician. He insisted, When I die, I shall rot. But his daughter, after her father's death, insisted that all his life was, as she said, a search for God, a search that went unfulfilled. What kept this philosopher from faith in Christ? Well, here's what she said. He had known too many blind Christians, bleak moralists who sucked the joy from life and persecuted their opponents. He would never been able to see the truth they were hiding with their lives. 
Dorothy Day has said, I really only love God as much as the person I love the least. If that's true, John the Baptist didn't love God very much because he wanted to bring death and fire from heaven upon his hated Samaritan enemies. He was prejudiced at least. He was self-seeking. In Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 and 2, Salome, the mother of James and John, the sons put her up to go and ask Jesus for a special favor. And so she does it. She says, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, will you give the place at your right and left hand to my two sons so that they can have the place of honor? This is within weeks of Calvary. After three years being taught at Jesus' feet, he is still seeking the special place of honor in the kingdom for himself and his brother and puts his mother up to it like a mama's boy that he was. I'd have flunked him on the spot. You're fired, I'd have said, but not Jesus. I am always astounded at God's love for the most unlovely people. <laughs> I wish I had more of it in my own life. I just came from hassling with the Social Security and the government bureaucracy and being put on hold for eternity on the phone line. Finally went in person and got a little better action. But I have such short patience for bureaucrats and people that can't afford babysitters and their kids are tearing the room apart. Gordon McDonald's tells this true story. He and his wife Gail were in an airplane seated almost at the back of the plane. As the plane loaded up, it assumed obviously every seat was taken, and a woman with two small children came down the aisle to take the seat right in front of us. And behind her, another woman, and the two women took the A and the C seats, in other words, the aisle and the window seat. And one of the children sat in the middle seat, and the second child was on the lap of one of the women. I figured these were two mothers traveling together with their kids, and I hoped the kids wouldn't be noisy. Good luck. The flight started, and my prayer was not answered. The air was turbulent. The plane bounced. The children cried a lot. Their ears hurt, and it was a miserable flight. As I watched, these two women kept trying to comfort their children. The woman at the window played with the child in the middle, trying to make her feel good and paying lots of attention. I thought, boy... These women get a medal for what they're doing, but things went down there from there. Towards the last part of the flight, the child in the middle seat got sick. The next thing I knew, she was losing everything from every part of her body. The diaper wasn't on tight enough, and before long, a stench began to rise through the cabin. It was unbearable. I could see over the top of the seat that the stuff you don't want me to describe was all over everything. It was on the woman's clothes. It was all over the seat. It was on the floor. It was one of the most repugnant things I had seen in a long time. The woman next to the window patiently comforted the child, tried her best to clean up the mess and make something out of a bad situation. The plane landed. When we pulled up the gate, all of us were ready to get off the plane as fast as we could. A flight attendant came up with paper towels and handed them to the woman in the window seat and said, Here, ma'am. These are for your little girl. And the woman said, this isn't my little girl. Aren't you traveling together, she asked. No, I've never met this woman and these children before in my life. Suddenly I realized I had just seen mercy and love lived out in the flesh. A lot of us would have just died in the circumstances, but this woman found the opportunity to give mercy. She was, in the words of Christ, the person who was my neighbor. That's the kind of love that Jesus showed, full of grace and truth. Well, that's not what John was to start with. He was ready to call down fire and destroy all his enemies. So what did John become? Well, the first and maybe the last thing I want you to remember about this little study on the Apostle John, he was by his own description, the Apostle of Love the apostle of love. In his first epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. This term, love, is found over 80 times in John's writings, 
in his gospel, his three epistles in the book of Revelation. Over 80 times he mentions love. It's the most common theme throughout the, the writings of John. What should I do with liberal Democrats? John would say, love them. What should I do with redneck Republicans? John would say, love them. What should I do with gays? John would say, love them. What should I do with people that are killing babies by abortion? John would say, love them. What about the Russians and that rascal Putin? Oh, this is hard. John would say, love them. He was the apostle of love. Secondly, he would want to be known as a humble brother. When he writes the book of Revelation, he identifies himself as your brother, your companion in trials. Listen to it for a minute, what he could have put on his resume. He was the last living apostle. They tried to kill him. They boiled him in oil and somehow he lived through it. He is the author of the Gospel of John, three epistles, the book of Revelation. He endured an exile to the island of Patmos. He's the pastor for 40 years at the church at Ephesus. The saints were tempted to make him a rock star. Instead, he says, I'm just a brother, a fellow companion in trials. Guys, there are no superstars in the kingdom except Christ. I had to decide early on when I became a pastor what I wanted people to call me. Dr. Meredith. Preacher. I thought about it and I worked hard for my doctorate degree, but if I insisted people call me doctor, I'm afraid the children would think I'm coming with a needle. And so I said, just call me Brother Al. That's enough. Like the Apostle John, a brother and a fellow sufferer, a companion in tribulation. He not only was the apostle of love, he was a humble servant and he was a faithful witness. And again, in the, the epistle of 1 John, let me turn to it. Chapter 1. He said, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship with the Father. He was a faithful witness. The Greek word for lit witness is literally the word martyr. We think martyr simply means those who die for their faith, and that's true, that's what it became to be. But a martyr was one who testified truly and faithfully in a court of law. Well, those who knew Jesus Christ as the sinless Son of God who died for the sins of the world testified with clear note, clarion call, that Jesus came in the flesh. He was the sinless Son of God. John was the first apostle to see the empty tomb. John was the first to recognize Jesus after fishing all night with his fishing buddies. He said, look, it's the Lord. In the gospel, you have the deity of Christ emphasized. In the epistles, you have the humanity of Christ emphasized. John was a faithful witness to what he'd seen. Like the man who was born blind, he says, look, I don't know much, but this one thing I know, once I was blind, but now I see. He was the apostle of love. Legend has it that about the time of his death in his 90s, that the mean-spirited son of thunder that would call down fire from heaven, he also became known as the apostle of love. And as a pastor in his 90s on his deathbed, surrounded by his parishioners, they begged him to import, impart one final word. With much effort, he whispered, love one another. Is there any more, they asked. That is enough, he said. And then he died. From the son of thunder to the apostle of love, a faithful martyr, a true witness. Well, the question is, what changed him? What produced this 180 degree turnaround? Let me point you to John chapter 19. I know we've skipped around a good bit, but I've wanted to get the full picture of the apostle John. John chapter 19 
and verse 25 and 26. It's a description of Calvary. And it said, And there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene, four women. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, now this is John writing, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. In a word, what changed John? was Calvary. Calvary is the Latin word for the hill the Hebrews called Golgotha, the place of the skull. We're not sure if because of the rock outcropping it looked somewhat like a skull. We know it was the garbage dump for all the carcasses of the sacrificial lambs and every other garbage people want to dump, so there were many skulls in the area. It was an ugly, obscene place outside the walls of the city by the main route, one of the main routes to Jericho. Nothing more ugly, nothing more barren, more hopeless than this garbage dump where death and dung was held in the air outside the camp. Even uglier was the mob screaming for his death, for his torture, crucify him, they insisted. I remember when Katrina, the great hurricane, hit New Orleans, Louisiana, and several hundred people went to the Superdome for refuge. But there without organization, without police protection, without security, they turned into a vile mob. A two-year-old was trampled to death. A 10-year-old child was raped. Several were wounded and several died. A desperately despicable place. But here at Golgotha, all of Jesus' disciples had deserted him except one. The one whom John describes as the one whom Jesus loved. When he first laid eyes on Jesus, the triumphing voice of John the Baptist was ringing across the hills. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How does he do that? On bloody Good Friday, he saw with his own eyes as he took upon himself all the sins of the world, suffered indescribably, and died. That's how he takes away the sins of the world. Now, for once, he has a glimpse of the cost of his salvation and yours and mine. Ira D. Sankey was Dwight L. Moody's music minister. Dwight L. Moody was the greatest evangelist of the 19th century here in America. Sankey was one of the great songwriters, and one of the songs he wrote was called The Ninety and Nine After the Parable. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was off in the hills far away, far off on the streets of gold. Away in the mountain, dark and bare, away from the she tender shepherd's care. And so his friends pleaded him, look, you got your ninety-nine here, aren't they enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And though the way is dark and deep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. Third verse. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark the night that our Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. There on Calvary, as all the most heinous sins of the world were laid in Jesus' account, and all the guilt and the shame and the remorse that those terrible, torturous sins had brought, Jesus experienced in full, and all the wrath of the Father against the sins of humanity was poured out on Christ, so much so that the sun refused to shine. In the midst of the darkness, the Father turned away, and the Son cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Then for three days, the Trinity is broken as the sun descends into hell itself. As John began to comprehend the cost of his redemption, this self-seeking son of thunder was transformed by Calvary love. The key truth for me, the one truth that has changed my whole life these 75 years now, is the truth that God should love me like that, to endure all of that on my behalf. All of John's selfishness and pride and prejudice and hatred melted away. John's resume could have been star-studded, an apostle of Jesus Christ, a member of the inner circle, an author of a number of books in the Bible, the Bishop of Ephesus, but his constant description five times in his writing, he identifies himself as the apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. There's an earth-shaking power in the love of Christ. Another old song, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the forest star and descends into the lowest hell. The last verse says, could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made and every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. To the tribesmen that lived near Robert Moffat's home in Crewman, South Africa, a man would never shed a tear in this particular tribe. To do so would have been what they called tholo or transgression. Men do not weep in this African trial, no matter what. One of them was a mighty hunter by the name of Baba. At one point in his life, he was torn from his horse and mangled by a lion, yet never shed a tear, and finally, though crippled, lived through it. Prayed quietly until he slipped into unconsciousness and somehow survived. But when Robert Moffat, the first missionary to South Africa, showed up in his village and told him of God's great love for him and his death on Calvary's cross for him. Baba's heart was so moved, he sunk to the crown with remorseful tears and sobbed without control as his heart was melted by the love of God. Someone asked the great German theologian Karl Barth if he could define God, and he simply said, God is the one who loves. Not a bad definition. When you get right down to it, it's all about love. When it comes to love, no one loves like Jesus. There's a true story of an orphan boy who was living with his grandmother in the 19th century in an English village. Both parents had died, so his grandmother took him in. When one night, the, fire, the, the home caught on fire. Grandmother was trying to rescue him, but she perished in the flames. The neighbors watched in horror as the boy cried from an upper window for help. Somebody save me. Finally, a brave man responded by climbing up an iron drain pipe, grabbed him, carried him down via that same iron drain pipe, but his hands were horribly burned and scarred. Several weeks later, the villagers held a town meeting to see who would be willing to take this now helpless orphan to their family. One farmer said, I can use another hand. I'll teach him about hard work. The teacher in the village says, I would take him. I'll teach him and train him. A wealthy landowner, the earl, said, I have no sons. I can afford to give him the blessings of life. And the boy just stood there with eyes to the ground while the townsmen wrangled for his life. Then a man walked forward and lifted his scarred hands. 
terrible burns. And the boy looked up and leaped into his arms and hung on for dear life. Those scarred hands settled the issue once and for all. This is the one who loves. Many voices call for our allegiance, but only one cared enough to die for your salvation. His hands are still scarred and his arms are still wide open. And he says, come, let me love on you. And let me turn your life around like I did the Apostle John. Oh God, I pray that those who are listening in would come to experience that unbelievable matchless love that you have for us, for me. Lord, eternity won't be long enough to thank you for all that you've done for me. May each one listening in today know you as the one who loved them enough to die for them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless. See you next week.